and welcome back, friends. We are here again at the Pro Aging Podcast, Season 2, Episode... I think we're on number 7. Oh, 7? We're on number 7. So wherever you are, you are here with me. And today, we are going to keep it very much on brand. This is about a lifestyle, kids, the pro aging lifestyle in medicine, in life, in health, and how we eat, drink, sleep, love. And I have a physician here, a very special physician, who has rounded out her education and training, who's really going to add a lot to today's conversation. Her name is Dr. Asmi Sangbi, and she is first and foremost a board certified dermatologist. She is also a doctor of osteopathic medicine. And she's had a very interesting journey along the way. She has had a fellowship in integrative dermatology. Don't worry, we'll get to explain all this in a little bit. She is also a chef and has had advanced training in Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic culinary arts. This is all about merging lifestyle, health, medicine, really so we could all be the best version of ourselves. And I really think the most important part of her resume is today, is her first day as an associate dermatologist at P. Frank MD. So I cannot be more excited to bring her expertise, her personality, and uh, her skill to the team at P. Frank MD. And uh, we're gonna talk about uh, making the world a better and more beautiful place. So thank you for coming, Asmi, I really appreciate it. And um, we got a lot to talk about, but I think first and foremost, I want to talk about how you got into osteopathic medicine you know for those of you out there there's people there are different routes you could take through medicine you can get an md degree which is a more traditional western approach but also which has become increasingly more popular over the years is osteopathic medicine equally as much as a physician um, but a little bit more broader scoped in terms of overall integrative medicine so i really want to know like what brought you down that path yeah, so, so happy to be here and I'm very excited to join the team. Uh, so osteopathic medicine, yeah. it's just as you said, yeah. it's another pathway, MD degree or a DO degree. And with the DO degree, the philosophy, the curriculum is the same. You're learning mm-hmm. the same anatomy, physiology, pathology, pharmacology, but the difference is the philosophy behind it. Yeah. So. In an MD school, you're learning the disease, the symptoms, how to treat the symptoms. And in an osteopathic school, you're learning more a holistic picture, how to treat the patient, how to look at all of the organ systems at the same time instead of just focusing on one. It's the same amount of time, the training, right? Same amount of time. time. Plus 200 extra hours of manipulative therapy. So this is like your chiropractic type of manipulation. And when you did the dermatology training, was it just for DOs or were you mixed with MDs as well when you did your, your, fel- your uh, residency? So my residency was actually an MD residency. Okay. Yeah, so. were, were there other DOs? Were there other osteopathic docs you came across or were you kind of like the lone person in the group? It was mostly MDs, but yeah. there were a couple of DOs as well. And really my what took me into skin and yeah. dermatology is similar philosophy and skin it's a dual thing it's internal and external the internal part is your skin is really a barometer of what's going on inside your stress levels how much sleep you're getting your anxiety how happy you are really shows up on your skin yeah but then skin is also kind of an external feature as well as you know the external designer yeah that's right exterior designer that's right she got that right uh, society, the way society yeah. perceives us and judges us is based on yeah. our skin. I, I think the ophthalmologists kind of like got the good marketing where they said the eyes were the window to the soul. I've always said the skin is the window to the soul. You could sell, tell so much about everything from how people eat, right? Nutritional deficiencies show in the skin, right? To their stress levels, to hormone levels, hormonal states. I mean, so many things are really expressed in the skin, more than the eyes, I think. Um, Go on. What's really interesting is the statistics around skin. Did you know that more attractive people get paid 12% more? Well, we, we know there are a lot of inequalities in the world based on gender, looks, wealth, all these things. But clearly, I think we can both agree, looking healthy, vital, quote unquote, attractive, certainly has its advantages. 
I mean, I also think the health, you know, it's really not just about beauty or health. I think they're, they're very integrated concepts, which is why I think you're such a great addition to P. Frank MD. I don't really look as beauty as a finite thing. Mm -hmm. I think when we do things for our health, it expresses in our beauty. And sometimes things that we do for beauty express in our health in terms of making us feel good spiritually, emotionally, and all these different things. So I think osteopathic medicine as a whole, my personal physician um, who's been on the show before, Dr. Richard Fershan, he's an osteopathic uh, physician. And I think society's coming more and more, if uh, you could agree, right? I think when I was in training, a DO, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, was a little bit more on the fringe, right? Yeah. Now I think it's almost more cutting edge. You know what I'm saying? And I'm sure there are a lot more DO programs um, that are out there. Was there dermatology training in, in DO? Because there really wasn't that much in medicine. In MD degrees, you don't learn that much about the skin. There is. There's a couple out there. Yeah. Um, and are there, are there any dermatology programs specific to DO? I know you said you went to a, a medical doctor one. There are. There's actually, when I was applying, I would say there's maybe like 12 or 15 really? that are primarily for osteopathics. Huh. So once you got into dermatology, I see here you did a you did a fellowship in derm in integrative dermatology. This is after your dermatology program. Yeah. Now, I think integrative dermatology is such an amazing terminology. This didn't exist 20 years ago. So tell me a little bit about something about integrative dermatology and the formality and just like what that fellowship was about. Yeah, so actually I I had a lot of training. I trained down in Florida for my yeah. residency. Um, I trained with Bosley, one of the top yeah, yeah. Excellent, uh, areas of uh, companies in the yeah. world. And then I came to New York City. I worked at Mount Sinai. I worked in a private practice at Greenwich Village. And while I was doing all this, I, I noticed that traditional medicine and traditional dermatology, what we learn, isn't really enough. Um, a lot of our patients could have benefited from more than just prescription medications. And so that's after I worked for a good year yeah. when I was kind of looking more into how to fix that gap that all dermatologists have in their education. In residency, how much training do dermatologists have in microbiome? No, no, nor, nor in running a practice, nor in business, yeah. nor in a lot of things. There are so many different gaps. And, just not having real world training in a lot of these things. So or in nutrition or yeah. in functional medicine. Yeah. So after practicing for, for a year or so, I I decided to seek out a way to bridge this gap. And and I'm a scientist first and foremost, so I didn't want to just learn kind of the any medicine that's not evidence based. Yeah. So I did this fellowship where we focused on what's evidence based. We looked at all the studies out there determine which ones are statistically significant, which ones are not really yeah. that bad. No, you, should, you went down at the real, you took a Western approach of statistics and data because I think, sadly, one of the misconceptions of integrative medicine is that there's a bit of like a woo-woo type of aspect to it. And I, and I think there is, um, in my opinion, there's as much fraud and salesmanship in Western medicine as there is in Eastern integrative medicine. The fact of the matter is, I think we could all agree that um, evidence-based medicine is how we have to look at things. And when we say evidence-based medicines, we use data, we use studies, we use peer review where multiple people are overlooking things. These are the key things with medicine. It's not like Western is all good or bad or Eastern uh, integrative philosophy. There's pros and cons to both. I think it's time now in society that we, that we integrate, which is what this is all about and really take the best, because there's no answers in either side, right? Right, it's really about the combination of finding what's best in each yeah. side. How, how, long, how long was the, this fellowship? How long did you it do was, it? It was a nine, nine months. Nine months. And this is all during COVID, right? So, yes, yeah, during COVID and while I was practicing yeah. full-time dermatologist. Yeah. And yeah, I learned a lot of really interesting things that I had started integrating with my patients. For example, we found that rosemary oil Use they compared people who use rosemary oil in their scalp versus Rogaine in their scalp, and they found that after six months, both groups grew the same amount of hair. Hold on, hold on, I need to get on this, kids. Okay, I need to get. Are you, really, you're telling me she's teaching me things on the first day. I could be. I could have been walking around with so much more hair. What if I use both? 
You don't. Yeah. We should, may have to do a study. <laughs> I'm going to let you do that study. Okay, we need, we're discovering things. Really? Rosemary oil? Yeah. And then another one is they found that the skin, actually, the skin on the face has a lot of receptors for CBD. Yeah. And so CBD actually helps a lot with calming down inflammation. Yeah. So we've been using it. I've been using it a lot for... Have you? Does, is it really? Does it helping? CB, everything, everything is CBD today, folks, right? Again, this is where I worry about, do I chew, get to chew it in a gummy too? Is it going to help my acne? No, no, but have you had experience using CBD for acne? So for acne and eczema, I actually, all my really? patients, I recommend a specific CBD-based skincare line, and they all love it. Are we going to bring that here to P. Frank MD? Definitely. Well, that's interesting, and you're using it, of course, you're using it complementary to other things, yeah. right? And I'm sure it's, it's non-irritating, right? Non-irritating. Yeah. Good cooling, calming. Maybe we're going to combine that with the new acne lasers we got. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, I think that's it, kids. Okay, it's all about combination. There's no one answer to anything in beauty, in medicine, or anything. It's the combination of approaches that I think uh, make the biggest difference. So, I mean, I don't even have to ask you these questions you're answering already about how you're going to integrate this because you seem to be doing this in your, in your own world already. Um, how do you think your fellowship is going to integrate in terms of beauty? Because clearly you're a medical dermatologist, as am I. Um, we do an enormous amount of aesthetic and beauty work here. I think, like we said before, beauty and medical dermatology is on a spectrum. It's not just like you're one or the other. And you're a doctor. We're scientists and doctors first and foremost. How do you foresee using the integrative medicine into, into cosmetic derm? Well, so exactly how you said before, mm. your skin is, uh, indicates how well you're sleeping, yeah. your stress, all that. And I think one of the big things with my fellowship is I learned kind of more of the mechanism of action behind all that. So, for example, did you know if you don't get enough sleep, you your skin reacts by the facial skin makes less oil. Yeah. You get drier skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it increases the amount of inflammation in your body. So lack of sleep actually does cause dull, dehydrated, Absolutely. aged skin. So really educating the patient on kind of the basics to, to glow from within. Yeah. I mean, this is really everything in the pro-aging uh, playbook. It's really just about people realizing, you know, understandably people are coming here and to other places. They want a quick fix, right? It's a little bit of, you could do things you can't do. You can only exercise so much. You can only use anti-aging cream so much. And they come in for that. But they have to realize that it takes a concerted effort. It takes a group effort. And there's no one way to get to feeling youthful and vital. And it really is a combination of approach. I give so many anecdotes in my, in my book um, about patients that once they make that difference, which is why, A, I need Dr. Sangby here at P. Frank MD with her expertise. And we work here with people like Dr. Jake Deutsch, <clears throat> who, who works at a P. Frank MD. Uh, nutritional nutritional expert Sarah Rage, who will be a uh, guest on the next podcast. But I think it's really important for us to also go outside of our expertise and work with other physicians that can help us. You know, we got to help each other because it takes an army, I think, to to be our best. Um, that's cool about the Rogaine and all that stuff. I like that. You came, she came to this podcast for good points, kids. Um, let's talk a little bit about food, which you know you and I have in common. I love to cook. I don't look at it so much as medicine, but I definitely look at it as a big part of my life. You became a chef. You studied at Ayurvedic culinary. Uh, med this was a, you almost look at it like a separate part of training, right? But did you grow up around food? Was and I grew up in an Italian family. Did you always grow up ar around food? Um, so I did. I just for some reason I've always been a foodie, and I'm, I've always been curious. Yeah. So so I always loved living in cities. I've lived in Chicago, Miami, Philadelphia, New York. I've always loved having the option to have every type of ethnic food ever because I just I love food and I've always been cooking I used to have a food block back in the day you, you cooked before I did and then I just I just refined it so really what motivated me to do the Ayurvedic culinary school is all the stuff I was learning in in the integrative fellowship where I was learning a, a lot about food as medicine and I wanted more of a of a tactical, like a practical way to bring this to patients. And so I wanted to study at Ayurveda Culinary School. And the, the idea, the philosophy of Ayurveda is 
food as medicine. So I learned more specifics about food. We all know that like fruits, vegetables, they all have like vitamins and, and protein, ca- carbohydrates, fats. But food is actually a little bit more powerful than that. It has phytochemicals and polyphenols. So some, some things I learned, uh, there's a chemical called indole-3-carbonyl that's found in broccoli and cauliflower that actually helps reduce acne and inflammation. And then there's oolong tea, which has a lot of polyphenols that actually studies have shown decreases eczema. And then more specific to beauty is beta carotene, which is found in mangoes. They did a study. They had women eat half a cup a day of mangoes four days a week. And then after four weeks, they had a 20% reduction in the amount of wrinkles. Oh, really? Yeah. 20%? (laughs) are what we eat and we age how we eat Mm -hmm. i mean i don't think you're old enough to appreciate this but if i eat a big plate of pasta and like like a big dessert i am definitely looking older the next day you're puffy you're retaining water your Mm -hmm. heaviness on around your eyes is different you see this in the short term and you also see it in the long term like if you have like a summer where you kind of fell off the wagon and ate a certain way i mean you do really as you get older you realize that your tolerance for different foods really does change and you have to if you want to feel good you have to put the right type of fuel in your body Mm -hmm. and if it makes you feel that way on the short term like a food hangover I call it imagine what it's doing to you if your diet is not right that being said I hope you agree we do see a lot of patients that come in and they like they go on like crazy diets for their acne they they don't want to take (laughs) Accutane ever or antibiotics or anything like that and food alone sometimes is not going to be the medicine right Mm -hmm. there are people who they sadly they have cancers right and they go on these like crazy diets and try and avoid i don't think the point of of this type of eating is to avoid western medicine it's to realize that these type of things it's your basic sustenance of life you might as well use it as a form of treatment yeah the way i like to see it is western medicine you get the treatment the medicine that you need and then food is either to prevent that from ever happening or to sustain the results of yeah. the western yeah approach. And, and I do think what's good for one person is not good for another nutritionally, just like medicine. Everyone's like, oh, no carbs, keto, this, uh, eat tons of avocados. I think people process things differently. I don't I mean, listen, we all know that sugar is probably bad for everybody. But I even know with things like alcohol, there are some people that can't tolerate it at all. There are other people who can have a glass of wine or two a day. It's fine. We know excessive amounts of anything is no good, right? Mm -hmm. Just like eating tons of beta carotene, it's going to not be best for you. So I think it's important to realize as the audience out there that a little bit of a lot of efforts really are always what make the biggest difference, what I always try and say to the patients. And I think food is such a great start because, right, we enjoy it. I think it's very meditative. I never cooked as a young adult, and now I find it very meditative, especially in the world of all the content we have. It, it feeds your soul a little bit. It keeps you busy. Even doing dishes uh, <laughs> does this. Um, to your point about the eating in excess, the same study actually looked at people who had double the amount of mangoes and they had more wrinkles at the end of the study. Really? Probably because of the sugar. Oh, my God. Yeah, mangoes are especially dried mangoes. I would stay away from the dried fruit, guys. Um, interesting. Now... I guess we got to figure out. I, I didn't. I was unaware of those studies. We got to figure out how diet and convince people how diet really does affect the way you age, right? Things like we're learning more and more now. <clears throat> I know so many of the um, newer weight weight loss drugs and drugs that are being studied for longevity, even are ones that are used in type two diabetes, mm-hmm. metformin, um, things like Ozempic. Uh, Munjaro. There are a lot of these medicines that uh, affect the hormone insulin levels and the way sugar is metabolized. And it doesn't only improve your health and decrease your risk of diabetes, but it's affecting your longevity. Because I do believe we could all agree, and everyone scientifically in health and nutrition agrees, that sugar is kind of the enemy. And our society, particularly American society, is really poisoned with just enormous amounts of sugar. I mean, I don't think it's the one or two packets of sugar that are going in my cappuccino in the morning that are killing me, but clearly all the processed foods, um, 
people go out to dinner an enormous amount now, not realizing that unless it's a very highly specialized restaurant, these places are just, <clears throat> they're cooking to flavor to get the audience in. And that means more of the common ingredients that make us feel good or get us high when we eat. And that is sugar, salt, <clears throat> high concentrated fats, things of that nature. So I think on an anti-aging spectrum too, we really have to get more of data um, like that. Are there any things that you'd like to see about how we use you know, what you've learned so far in cosmetics and outlook? I mean, this is what, this is what I brought you into P. Frank MD for. You know, what, 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 are, what are kind of your goals? Um, so I'm just excited to, to keep doing what I'm doing. As you know, as doctors, we're lifelong learners. And, and teachers. I'm, and teachers. And I'm excited to continue to integrate the, the lifestyle, the functional medicine, the nutrition into, into cosmetics and see, see how that goes. I want to know, because, you know, we do a lot of things here at P. Frank MD. We got a lot of treatments. And although she comes from a place of doing a lot of general dermatology and cosmetic, I think uh, we're both going to have a lot to learn from each other and uh, bring us up a level. I would say I'm most excited to learn about body treatment. I always say the... Um, there's more real estate below the neck than anywhere else. And there's so much techno techno technologically that is coming out now, not just in fat removal, but, um, you know, we've, we, everyone always thinks about the face when they think of cosmetics. Yeah. I think the body is super important, whether it's as simple as the health and sun damage, keeping your skin clear. Um, but there's just so much going on different, on different levels. Uh, now we have so many treatments. That's the other thing that people are like. People are like, oh, body treat. I always say body is the new face. Yeah. But body is, people aren't just interested in body treatments because all of a sudden it's a new fad. But now that there's so many minimally invasive options, yeah. it's not a, a tummy tuck. So They don't have to do plastic surgery. There's yeah. room in between. Yeah, there's room in between. And I think to me that's the most exciting thing about what we do here at P. Frank MD. You really, it's about offering a full spectrum, but also knowing when we need to refer out because you know what we do i do have a lot of patients and you're going to see in your own patients that you develop here we have a lot of patients that have been on a journey of self-improvement they've lost 50 pounds they've controlled their hypertension their diabetes they've found better ways to sleep to meditate they've used botox fillers lasers to make these improvements but people hit walls you know sometimes you know there's loose skin after losing 50 pounds <laughs> yeah. sometimes you've lost 20 pounds after covid and your metabolism has changed and that last eight to ten around the belly and gut uh from hormonal changes and stuff is there and what people don't ha what have to realize is that and i don't certainly what i try and teach them doing things when you've when you've really put all this information into yourself is not a cop-out Mm -hmm. It's not a cop-out. It's a form of grooming. And I think for those people who are willing to put in the pro-aging lifestyle effort, they deserve the help from any angle they can get. And then really, that's where we come in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our patients do need the guidance because what I like to pride ourselves about here at P. Frank MD is that we really do look at it as a lifestyle approach. People think we're just a conveyor belt of injecting, <laughs> sucking, and filling, and lasering, and stuff like that. But to me, I'm about happy patients getting good results. And I really do believe that you have to at least have that discussion about other things when you sense it's not going wrong. I'm not, we're not going to pry into other people's lives if they don't want to talk about it, but at least bringing it up and bringing in the expertise and having a good referral source. Many of, many of you who listen to the Pro-Aging podcast have heard from many of the experts that we've come in other aspects of integrative medicine, and um, functional medicine, anti-aging medicine, um, and in beauty treatments. So I think uh, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna make a very good team, don't, mm -hmm. don't you think? Yeah. Um, I wanna hear a little bit more about how, you know, because I also get the impression you do practice what you preach, right? Mm -hmm. I see you on Instagram. You're the only other person I wanna get recipes from. Actually, <laughs> in her contract with us, she's gonna be cooking <laughs> meals and lunches at P. Frank MD. She was the <laughs> fine print. It was the fine print. But clearly, you walk the walk and talk the talk. I know you practice Reiki, you meditate. First of all, w what's going on with the Reiki thing? I have a Reiki <laughs> healer myself. I spent half of my life thinking it was a little, you know, Reiki off kilter, but I now thoroughly believe in it. Do you actually practice it? Yes, I do. So Reiki, for those who don't yeah, know it, it's, it's using the universal energy 
through touch to heal somebody. And that, that does sound like a lot of woo-woo, but they've done studies. No, they, they've compared people who are doing Reiki to sham Reiki, which you still do the touch, so people like wouldn't know that it's not Reiki. Yeah. And they saw that there was a statistical difference in how relaxed they felt, how, how much calmer they were. Physical like pain was decreased. Yeah. So much so that actually academic centers, Johns Hopkins, Mass General, Mayo Clinic, all have Reiki as part of their hospital yeah. system. I mean, again, I've spent a lot of my life being um, dissuading myself out of certain things, being naysayer. And uh, as I get older, I become a lot more open-minded. You learn from patients. You learn from other people around you. And when it comes to Reiki, I think it's so clear and so logical um, on, a, on a physical level, we know children and adults who live their lives without touch of any kind are debilitated emotionally. Think about the touch of a loved one sexually, a touch of a parent, a hug from a friend, these type of things. There's energy between people, yeah. you know what I mean? And you don't have to be lovers or best friends or family to exchange energy, right? There are good vibes out there, and we try and minimize get rid of the bad vibes that certain people good and maximize the good vibes. And I think Reiki is a, it's almost a scientific extension yeah. of that. And I've learned when I first came uh, through a good friend of mine, Heidi, um, when it was the first time I really got something out of it, it really made me feel that difference than when I didn't have it anymore. So uh, where do you get trained in something like that? Is it something, is it a talent that everyone could have? I get the feeling that it's something like, you could either have it or not have it. It's not something you could always teach. There are certain people that just energetically have it, no? So, so some people do have that kind of underlying, I guess you can call it like talent. Yeah. Um, so we actually... Like touched... injecting face. <laughs> you can teach it, but you can't, you can't exchange the talent. <laughs> it. So it was actually through my integrative fellowship. We, oh, really? we studied it, and then they said, if you want to learn more here, it's, it's actually Dr. Ju Dr. Judith Hong. She is a doctor who practices Reiki, medical doctor, um, dermatologist, actually. And so I got into contact with her, and then she gave me the training, and I did the courses through her. And that's how I, got, I became certified. All right. So if I watch, we'll walk into a room, and your hands are hovering over someone with your eyes closed, I'll, I'll know what you're doing. Yeah. And you also meditate. What kind of meditation do you so I do a transcendental meditation. Oh, you do what I do? Yeah. Okay, we probably talked about this before. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we bonded over that yeah, when yeah, we first yeah. met. Uh, how many years have you been doing it? Short, maybe three years. Yeah. Do you get it in twice a day? You try to? I try to. Yeah. And I, like, I would have benefited from it. I'm, so I'm a very energetic person. Uh, while I was a full-term dermatologist in the city, I was doing the Integrative Fellowship, the Ayurvedic Culinary School, all at the same time, which someone from the outside would be like, I attribute that energy from the transcendental meditation. That's where I got it from. It also makes me more open and understanding and increased my emotional intelligence. Um, I, it's changed who I am as a person. It also gave me a sense of calmness. Yeah. Such an amazing group, the David Lynch Foundation, which really supports transcendental meditation all over the world, um, helping veterans, uh, people who are incarcerated, uh, people who are suffering from addiction, people who are trying to get out of bad situations. Um, I really can't uh, recommend it enough to get older. We're going to keep your feet moving here, Osmi. And thank you so much for coming. I'm going to yeah, see you every day. You. All right, guys. <laughs> we will see you later.